Good evening. You are listening to a Rattledge and Broadcasting Premier Podcast TV party tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And tonight, our favorite show is The Wonderful, The Wonderful, The Wonderbar World of Mickey Mouse. Yes, it's the House of Mouse. We're back again. Uh, this time... This uh, this particular show is a show that uh, was produced by Disney Television Animation for Disney+. Plus. It is a continuation and revival of the, now get this, Emmy Award winning Mickey Mouse TV series that uses the same style and is many of the same cast and crew with the exception of the late Rissy Taylor as Minnie Mouse who was replaced by Caitlin Robrock. The series was first announced on September 14th, 2020 and pre- premiered on November 18th, 2020, to coincide with Mickey's 92nd birthday. This first bit uh, what ran for five weeks. There were two shorts released uh, each day, starting November 18th, then the 27th, then the 4th, then the 11th, and then wrapping up on December 18th for a total of 10 eight-minute shorts. This podcast is going to be longer than the total running time of this entire show, but that's all right. And speaking of the House of Mouse, the Queen of Animation, ladies and gentlemen, back from her roaring tour of Animaniacs and Looney Tunes and here to knock your socks off, talking about the wonderful world of Mickey Mouse, from Honeysuckle Rose Creations, Alexis Haina. How do you do, madam? Who's the leader of the club that's made for you and me? M-I-C. Keep going. (laughs) (laughs) K-E-Y. (laughs) <laughs> Hamel, you is he, Mickey Mouse. Go fuck yourself, oh, Mickey Mouse. Oh, sorry. What did you say? <laughs> Mickey Mouse, go fuck yourself, Mickey Mouse. It's Donald <laughs> angrily yelling at Mickey Mouse. Okay, that was definitely not where I was going with this. Believe it or not, that was not like an impromptu bit. Um, I, I have been... I, I, for whatever reason, whenever I think about the Mickey Mouse Club theme song and they go to the Donald Duck part, I always imagine Donald Duck like giving the finger or whatever. Like, just leave me alone. Uh, so much for keeping our show children friendly. My children listen to it all the time. Yeah, I know. And we're already calling child developmental services. Developmental? Child protective. Protective. Protective? Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. So in all seriousness, this, uh, uh, so Mickey Mouse, right? The original iteration of this ran from 2013 to, um, 2018. And then there were two specials in 2016. And, um, and then this one on Disney plus one of the many, uh, of the original Disney plus shows that they were rolling out to get you to buy the damn thing. So, I, you know, these all premiered on the Disney Channel, and they ran for uh, uh, between eighteen to twenty shorts apiece. Are you? How familiar are you with the first iteration of this version of the Mickey Mouse cartoons? The ones that uh, premiered on YouTube as well as the Disney Channel. I have actually watched those quite a bit. I love the animation, the style. It's kind of the nice callback to. Uh, earl- both earlier cartoons and I would say the comic books as well. I think they're kind of taking a page out of what they did with the DuckTales reboot. It gives it a really unique style. It's a lot of fun. Um, I love the... We, we were talking about this earlier. We had the, they did a lot of international shorts where they were in other places and they were speaking different languages. I thought that was very clever. And not to mention very, uh, I would say, inform- educational for kids. And yeah, I... I love just putting the shorts on in the background while I'm working at home. And they're on Disney Plus now, and they're really enjoyable. So, when the my, I, I've seen some of these. Uh, my kids watch them. Apparently, my son watched a whole bunch of these. Because when I told him we were watching The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse, he was like, I've seen them already. And I'm like, there's there's no possible way. And he was like, oh, they, wait, there's new ones? That's what you're talking about? And I'm like, yes. 
he was oh hot dog i love these things and he's been trying to pitch to me that i should go back and watch these previous five seasons um he loves the style of animation when i first saw it uh i i don't know i think uh this might be my age showing but you know we just watched like uh some of the old mickey mouse christmas cartoons around uh, around the holiday not just mickey's christmas carol but um like the house of mouse and uh once upon a christmas i think they're called and mm-hmm. these are and these are the computer uh, generated ones uh animated ones and i think like one of them mickey works on a christmas tree a lot and it's like you know their their version of the gift of the magi and it's all mickey looking in his like traditional cartoon look and Minnie looking in you know the way that she normally looks and I kind of prefer that I like I like Mickey with you know with the with the broad round face and ears and everything and you know has that sort of 1930s mentality to him um, mm-hmm. you know these kind of you know I, I was thinking back to our Animaniacs show and so, and the uh, Looney Tunes especially where they try to give the classic cartoons a facelift and a more contemporary feel and it doesn't feel like the cartoons that I grew up with which they're not um and I was more accepting of it with Looney Tunes I think when I go thinking back to when we talked about that show uh other than the gross bubblegum one you know I was like okay I I I get what they're doing here and I kind of like most of it here I was and I don't want people to think like, oh, he's going to bash all over this thing. I actually ended up really liking the shorts that I saw. Uh, in fact, I like them better than Looney Tunes, to be honest with you. But going into it is what I'm trying to say. I don't like this artistic style. And I, and I, going into it, I had a hard time accepting the way, you know, this update to the Mickey Mouse character. I didn't mind so much the update to the character, mostly because I felt that this was the first time in ages they really gave Mickey character. Mickey Mouse, in so many iterations, is the bland good guy. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, he is the, the good-hearted everyman. He is meant for kids to identify with. They want Kids are supposed to want to be like Mickey Mouse. Mm-hmm. But often in the earlier shorts, things didn't really happen that much to Mickey. The the slapstick and everything happened more to Goofy and Donald. Or they Pluto. Could, or Pluto, yeah, because they could get a lot more physical and they could get angrier. I mean, yeah, no, nothing is go- nothing's better than watching Donald just completely lose his freaking mind. Well, I was thinking about, like, a Mickey, a really good example of what you're talking about is the another Christmas cartoon. One that gets played, especially around my house, around Christmas time. And it's a Chip and Dale cartoon, but it has Mickey and Pluto in it. And Mickey is not the star of this cartoon. Oh, this the is... Pluto's Christmas tree. That's a classic. Right. And so the, 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 the bit here is that um, they went out and chopped down a tree. And, of course, it's, it's like every Bugs Bunny set up. <laughs> every, <Yeah. laughs> you know, they happen to pick the one goddamn tree in the forest that had Chip and Dale in it. And so he's dressing the Christmas tree. And Chip and Dale are messing with the Christmas tree. And, of course, everything that they do, Pluto sees. And he tries to get Mickey to see it. And Mickey completely misinterprets Pluto's intentions or misses what Pluto's trying to point out. And it's the same gag two and three and four times until finally Mickey is pulled into the Christmas tree with Pluto and Chip and Dale. And the whole thing is ruined. And he says, you dumb mutt. And then he, <laughs> and then he realizes there's chipmunks in the tree and goes... He goes, Pluto, there's chipmunks. And Pluto's like, you motherfucker. Yeah, Pluto does the ultimate face palm. Like, oh, are you kidding me? That yeah. was great. Um, but that's a really good example of, of what you're saying about how Mickey is sort of orbiting the action. The action happens to Pluto or Donald or Goofy. And there's usually an antagonist in like Chip and Dale or Pete or somebody. Exactly, but these new ones, Mickey is given a lot more character development. You see him get mad, you see him get frustrated, you see him get angry. There's a little, you get, a, he gets a little bit more of the brunt of the slapstick, and I enjoyed it. I, again, I don't think there's anything wrong with the earlier shorts where Mickey was the good-hearted everyman, but I like these that are actually 
really having him take more of a front and center stage to his own cartoons. Yeah, I would tell you up until the very end, um, which we're going to talk at length about because, oh boy. Um, oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Donald is, and I used to watch, I don't know if you remember this, um, I mean, they were seven years apart, so you might not have been watching or alive when uh, this was a thing, but on the Disney Channel, there used to be a syndicated collection of Donald Duck shorts called Donald Duck Presents. Do you remember that? Mm, can't say I do. I probably did see it, but it's not ringing a bell. Okay. Donald Duck Presents. Na, 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 na. Donald Duck Presents. Da, 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 da. Anyway. Um, so that one you start singing, but when I try to cue you for the Mickey Mouse uh, Club theme, all of a sudden you just can't even get it right. <laughs> I, I, got, I got it right as far as I'm concerned. Um, so We should have rehearsed. <laughs> uh, so I was thinking about, like, you know, Donald has a lot... Between Donald and Donald's nephews, Donald by himself, there's a shit ton of Donald Duck out there. And there's a shit ton of Goofy. Like, Goofy is, you know, has those series of how-to... Um, how-to cartoons that are classics, and those are the ones everyone remembers and everyone loves... Even, yeah, like, the, the more modern ones, like, how to hook up your, your entertainment center. Oh, I love that recent one. That was the, I, I hate to say it. I'm the moron that when the box shows up and you see the instructions, I'm the idiot that pauses it every time because there are, that thing is covered in, in jokes. <laughs> and I'm just going nuts looking for all of them. But, yeah, Goofy had that whole series of uh, the Everyman I gotta ask, what is actually your all-time favorite uh, Everyman Goofy cartoon? Do you know? Oh, gosh. Um, I like him playing football. I think that one's funny. Uh, I, I need to look at a list of them, because I know there's a whole bunch in there that are really hysterical. Like, I think about the one of him playing baseball. Um, the one playing football is really funny. The hockey ones. The, the hockey one, the explanation from the narrator is what cracks me up. Because they do that like what that that pull back wide shot of the hockey rink, and they're trying to explain to you how hockey works. It's just dots all over the place. It's great. <laughs> See, my favorite is the how to ski or the art of skiing. That's a good but one. It's that actually a lot of people credit that one because that gives us the absolute best recording of the iconic Goofy yell when he's mm -hmm. going down the uh, the ski jump. There's one of him dancing, isn't there? Yes! Oh, I love the How to Dance. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, and we, Horribly, we've... richly, and sensitive by current standards, but still great. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another, I mean, there's another series of ones that he's done. Uh, the Mr. Wheeler stuff. We've talked about that in the past. Like, I don't remember what what made me bring it up. But there's an entire series of Goofy, uh, Mr. Wheeler, which are hilarious. Um I do love the uh, pogo stick one. That's a great one. Not to mention, mm -hmm. really iconic of wartime. So mm -hmm. I, I've got a real thing for cartoons that you were clearly made with kind of a message of wartime era. And mm -hmm. can only be seen as like a bit of a mild propaganda in a way. So I love watching the shorts about rationing and, you know, donating your scrap metal and things like that. So it's fun. Fascinating. So the point that... Alexis and I are sort of dancing around, coming back to it, is how Goofy and Donald and Pluto and even Chippendale have gotten so much over the years. Um, and they are relegated to background characters in this show, which makes sense. It's the Mickey Mouse show. We get it. Um, so your point is well taken that Mickey Mouse has made a prominent figure in his own goddamn show. And they, they give him all the personality. They give him a lot of the jokes. They make him the protagonist in these eight-minute shorts. And he's against Pete in some. He's, um, you know, they, they, they bring in some new characters for him, to, you know, to mess with. These more resemble, like, Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes shorts than the classic Mickey Mouse. And maybe that's the reason why I love it so much. There's an old saying that classic Warner Brothers or classic Walt Disney cartoons were like classical music. Classic Warner Brothers cartoons were more like jazz. This is the first time that you really feel, uh, like you said, uh, Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney 
stepping out of their comfort zone and stepping into the shoes of another animation style. But frankly, I enjoy it. And maybe that's my bias because I love this style from Looney Tunes and Hanna-Barbera and Tom and Jerry, but I really enjoy it. Yeah, and, and I want to be clear. I liked this. I liked it, I think, more than Looney Tunes. I definitely laughed out loud more. There was not a single one of these that I had to get up and walk away <laughs> or shut my eyes because it was gross. So automatically, this was better than the Looney Tunes shorts. Um, I just had that bias going into it because I really do love and appreciate, I, th as you described, the kind of Mickey Mouse that you can project yourself on. Mm -hmm. um, that the, th There's so little innocence in the world of television and movies. Mickey Mouse was one of those things that I kind of hung on to. And he's not even my favorite character. My favorite characters are, are the Duck family. Scrooge, Victor Von Drake, um, Ludwig Von Drake, sorry. Von, Professor Von Drake is actually my all-time favorite uh, Disney character. You know, Donald... So you know, I am I am a huge fan of the of the of the middle and uh, middle aged and elderly ducks, but um, you know, uh, old but, man of the mountains. Yep, and I don't want them painted. Um, <laughs> but I and we'll move on from this. I just uh, Mickey was one of those things I felt was like untouchable. I think, like oh, and leave Mickey alone in his innocence, and nope. Mickey's right. Mickey's throwing pies and, you know, and, and doing Mox Brothers routines. And it's like, ah, oh, Mickey, this is, this, this is, you're above this sort of thing, Mickey. You're, 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 you're cartoon Jesus for Christ's sake. All right, moving on. Um, so November 18th, we have a pair of shorts here. Uh, we have Cheese Wranglers first. And this, this actually, they, they previewed before the series came out. And it reads, uh, Minnie Mouse, the proprietor of Big Thunder Valley, hires Mickey Mouse, the best cheese wrangler in the West, to ride every cheese wheel to town with her ranch hands, Donald and Goofy, assisting him. But they need to keep the cheese safe from the infamous cheese wrestler, Peg Leg Pete. And Humphrey the Bear makes a brief cameo on this. I, I laughed pretty hard at this. They came, out of, they, they came storming out of the gate with a really funny one. First of all, the concept of like cheese wheels acting as... Cows, <laughs> cattle, yeah. was pretty hilarious to me. Not to mention, it lets you have a lot of fun because there is no easier uh, humor base than cheese puns. <laughs> um, yeah, this one, uh, this one cracked me up. A lot of the, a, a lot of the bits with the cheese, uh, the, the the rolling cheese wheels acting as cattle uh, made me laugh out loud. My kids got a big kick out of it. This this one was a hit for me. Do you have any other thoughts on it? I love the recurring gag that every time someone says the code, their voice deepens and it, they <laughs> get all really close, like a freaking John Wayne camera, just how serious it is. And even Donald Duck is like, tell me about the code. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> y y that's just great humor. Yeah, that was pretty funny. The second short, I was dying at this. I th This made me like tear up with laughter. This was the House of Tomorrow. And this actually guest starred Alan Tudyk. As the house. Um, at the Hall of Science, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy sneak into Professor Ludwig von Drake's House of Tomorrow. A futuristic we love you, house Alan Tudyk. With an artificial intelligence tending to meet their every need, which turns out to be, not to be the dream they were envisioning. Uh, this episode is a tribute to the uh, original Tomorrowland attraction at Disneyland, the Monsanto House of the Future. Um, and at, they even have both Mickey and the house sing the classic Sherman Brothers song. There's a great big, beautiful tomorrow. I laughed at that hard. Like I caught that and I, I that that was like a huge guffaw for me where where uh, I was laughing pretty loudly. I mm -hmm. love this episode. I thought this was great. You know, the I, <laughs> I was telling my wife about it. Like I was this made me laugh so hard because you have because the setup essentially is that at first, you know, First, they walk past the house, and Ludwig von Drake tells them, hey, it's not even ready yet. Don't go in there. And Mickey's like, but artificial intelligence. Like, they, they wrote into his character that Mickey loves technology, so he has to check this house out. And, of course, Donald and Goofy follow him. And so there's the three of them. There's also a bit of a continuation from the those earlier Mickey Mouse shorts that we were talking about because – in at least three separate shorts that I can count, whenever they visit Professor Von Drake, something goes wrong for Donald. <laughs> so 
he he yeah so when they're so mickey's like let's go away and donald's like i don't get along well with technology and it's like <laughs> yeah we know <laughs> um so so they kind of separate the three of them um Mickey goes to one area, and, and at first it starts out really well. The house is taking good care of him. The, it's getting him to relax. I think the first big belly laugh I had was he pulls a book out. It's I, Bambi. Yeah. yeah. He, and the house, like, just, it's, and the house, like, they kill Bambi's mother. <laughs> did, did you, I don't know if you ever watched The Big Bang Theory, but there's an episode where Sheldon ruins um, Harry Potter for, uh, for Leonard. And you know, and it start, it sparks a huge fight between them, uh, which had been brewing for a while. But the whole thing started off with, you know, him spoiling the book, and it was one of those moments. And that's part of the reason why I laugh so hard. Big Bang Theory is actually a point of contention with me and my mother. See, she loved, love, 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 love that show. I watched a bit of it. I did think that it was genuinely funny. However, every time I try to tell my mother about my life in the Comic-Con circuit, she put her hands up and said, we don't care. We don't know anything about that kind of stuff. You're talking about, you know, something that's going in one ear out the other. And I would just stare at her going, how can you watch Big Bang Theory and be such a fan of it and not pick up any of the geek culture references that it says and that I'm sharing? And she would just be like, I don't know. But she never wanted to listen to me talk about meeting voice actors or, you know, trends in animation or anything, or, you know, the new comic books or anything. And I'm like, you watch Big Bang Theory. You should be at least remotely interested in what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the, when the house tries to spoil the book for, or does in fact spoil the book for Mickey Mouse and the face that he makes, and it gets, <laughs> goes on like that. Like everything, like anything Mickey tries to do for himself, the house then does. To, you know, and and it becomes this and this be, I guess becomes like a reoccurring theme with the series where the house turns into like a horror monster <laughs> like you know and, and Mickey's trapped and he can't get out and it's like what the hell um I, refresh my memory what is happening to Donald I remember at one point he's he's in a dark part of the house but I can't remember why since the ma- since the house I always said since the mouse <laughs> all mm-hmm. hail the mouse since the house can predict what each person needs it says that Donald obviously needs to relax right because that that is the reoccurring joke with Donald is that you know sweet Jesus somebody get this man a tranquilizer and a stiff alcoholic drink <laughs> and at first it's working but when things start to get a little rough Donald starts to get nervous and the house goes you need to relax more and at one point it gives him a a very uh, unappreciated shiatsu massage. Right, <laughs> okay. Back. Um, and then Goofy, you know, it's like, tell me what you want and, you know, anything you want. And, of course, Goofy can't make up his mind. Um, and so <laughs> he's at a standstill with the house because he can't come up with anything because there's too many choices. Um, and this becomes a gag later on to get him out of the situation. So both Donald and Mickey are are in hell <laughs> and and the house uh, has them trapped and it won't let them out and finally the gag with Goofy is what saves them because Mickey says alright Goofy tell them all the things you want and it overloads the house's circuits and it blows up <laughs> so, and then they even Ludwig von Drake is none the wiser um, I think he walks past the house after they've run for their lives and yeah, sees that it's on no fire idea. yeah and he says I'll deal with it tomorrow but I'm <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that. Uh, November 27th, we have Hard to Swallow. Mickey tries to get Pluto to eat his fleep. Oh, this one, which Pluto finds disgusting. The situation becomes dire when an army of fleas targets Pluto. And this is where Fifi makes her first appearance in the series. So, yeah. Um, this is a back and forth between Mickey and Pluto where he's trying to get him to take the pill. And it's the old thing we do with the dog when you try to hide the pill in the food. Um, at every turn, Pluto is confounding Mickey. And uh, and he won't take the pill, and they even go over to Minnie's house, and Minnie has successfully gotten the dog to take her pill, so they try it with Pluto, and Pluto actually hips Fifi to the jive, and now Fifi won't take the pill, and fleas overwhelm <laughs> poor Minnie's apartment, and it's um, you've seen this gag in cartoons before. It's normally done with roaches, uh, or ants, one of the two. Um, in this particular case, it was done with fleas, but basically. Um, it's you know it's also been done with bees. So any small insect creature, 
uh, morphs into this large monster creature and can form the, I, form sorry, different it like Green Lantern it can form physical objects and hit you with them <laughs> and stuff like that go ahead I was like, I think I've actually seen this done before where it was t- a kid needs to take his medicine and they won't so all of a sudden the germs are coming and you could just see like what looks like a carpet and it's just tons of germs tons of yeah. you know so. um so it gets down to where the fleas have a, have have left mini um and they now att- they're now attacking Mickey Mouse and it's dire and if Pluto doesn't take this pill they're all going to die basically <laughs> and Pluto finally takes the pill um it was it was I mean I I'm laughing now it was mildly amusing at the time but there was and and and, and again I want to come back to this but they definitely wrote some horror elements into this like kitty television show yeah the, the fleas take the form of a freaking oven and pluto is put on a platter and being <laughs> let into it's like what I, you've ever seen pluto's judgment day the short where he is sent to hell yes i'm just they're going wow okay apparently someone's a fan of that shorts <laughs> uh yeah that's the that's the bit with the angel and the devil on his shoulder yeah, and them sentencing him basically to burn in one of those. They put the. It's like that thing from Silent Hill where they put you in the chair that has no seat under it, and they're like holding you over the fire. Right. And yeah, this is because he kept attacking the cat. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Yeah, it was one of those deals. I think uh, there's an iteration of the similar thing in, in a Tom and Jerry cartoon, if I remember correctly. Oh, um, yeah. I have to say, though, this did make me laugh because if anyone who has owned a dog or, or just a pet in general and has had trouble getting them to take their pills, for the record, the the inventor of those little uh, edible pill pockets, God bless you for <laughs> making our lives so much easier. But, oh, man, the times that I had trying to get my dog, my old Cocker Spaniels, Pelly and Chauncey, my old Golden Tree, Redungamel, Shepherd, Barney, trying to get them to take their pill. You throw the pill in their mouth, and you clamp it shut, and you start rubbing their throat, trying to get them to swallow, and somehow they rolled it up in their tongue, and when you think they're finally done, they go, Pleh, and they <laughs> spit the damn thing out. The next one... <laughs> Sorry, I got on the little uh, tirade there. I, it, I have it, had nightmares. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. Um, feel, feel free to go on, on as many tangents as you want, but... Um, this next one, boy, you weren't kidding when they said they really wrote a lot of character into Mickey. The problem is they wrote Mickey as a psycho. Between this, <laughs> <laughs> like he's just a lunatic throughout the most of these. And this is a really good example of that. This one's called School of Fish, and this one Mickey sends his goldfish Gubbles to school, but becomes so concerned for his well-being that he begins to follow him everywhere. So yeah, like, he said he's a goldfish, and my kids thought this was the st- was funny, but like also the stupidest thing ever, because you know, little children will point out the obvious to, you know, to the point where it, 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 it can become grating. And so my son picked up that they're playing on the pun of a school of fish. Get it? Fish travel in schools yep, like yep, lunches. Yep. So they send the fish to school because it's a school of fish. Get it? Side note, this is actually one of the things I absolutely love about these shorts. The teacher fish is uh, the fish form Merlin takes in the sword and the stone. Yeah. And this is one of the things I love so much is that even though the, the show focuses in, on Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Goofy, and Daisy, the backgrounds are Filled with so many characters and little cameos and nods to previous uh, Disney portrayals, and I love that. I love that they're taking advantage of things yeah. like, you know, I, I remember one short where Minnie it thinks there's a thief, and she starts interrogating, and she interrogates the Beagle Boys and the Evil Queen from Snow White and the Phantom Blob or Blot, Blob, Blot. I can't remember, but um... again. Yeah, I, I, I actually didn't pick it up with this episode, but the next one, the disco one, I did. Yeah, oh, God, Yen Sid, but we'll get to that in a second. I think kids are not going to relate to this one as much as because I don't think they're going to get the helicopter parrot joke. I mean, my kids got it. You know, they, they, they understood the physicality of what was happening. I mean, my kids are both in school, 
and you know there is clearly they, their mother teaches in the school that they currently attend in person. I have to make that distinction because COVID. Um, but uh, yes, we are not homeschooling our children. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but. My wife, like, like can't follow them around the school. Despite the fact that she works there, my kids have very much understood that mommy can't come into the classroom unless she's working in there. And even if she is, she's not there really to interact with you. You can say hello, but uh, as you would any teacher, but this isn't, you know, my wife is there to do a job. She's, a, she's an ESE specialist, so she comes into the classroom to work with the ESE kids. Um, mm-hmm. These... these these were kids who 20, 30, 40 years ago would be referred to as special ed, by the way, in case people don't know the lingo. Um, so, like, my kids got basically what was happening, and they certainly understood that neither one of them are necessarily at an age yet where mom and dad are embarrassing, but they certainly appreciate their own individuality and, and the freedom such as it is when you're 7 and 10 years old. Um so when Mickey is so so when the, so when the goldfish is in class and he's raising his hand to answer a question and then you pan to the to the right and there's Mickey crouched into a desk and the fish is like what the fuck man um, and this keeps happening you know Mickey turns up in the cafeteria Mickey turns up in a locker Mickey you know, Mickey is everywhere and it's it's he starts off as just hovering. But descends into talking baby talk with the fish and infantilizing him. Like yeah, one you, point... get, you get a scene where the fish sharpens his pencils to start writing, and Mickey is too terrified of him poking himself with the pencil, so he gives him a kid-friendly crayon. The one that I was thinking about was in the cafeteria where he has him in the baby chair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, of course, all the other fish are laughing at him. Um, and so, like, they're like, yeah, that would suck. If mom, if school were actually like that, and mom were that kind of a psychopath, we we, we would not enjoy it as much. Um, but uh, yeah, like Mickey's a psycho; <laughs> he's a crazy <laughs> person. Um, I mean, you know, the, the the joke. Thank God these are eight only eight minute shorts because the joke got old after about two minutes. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, the conclusion uh, of this is the conclusion of every version of this kind of story something comes finally the, the the fish snaps and tells mickey to go fuck himself um and so mickey fucks off and uh at some point uh, some some big fish attacks the school and the little in the goldfish defends the school and becomes a hero and mickey's like oh i guess you can take care of yourself okay see you at home but not before getting locked in the locker one last time sure what'd you think of this one not bad a little on the predictable side mm-hmm. but still enjoyable it's kind of funny because I didn't really thank god my parents weren't helicopter parents but I didn't know anyone with crazy helicopter parents until I went to college okay my, I had a I had a roommate who shared an apartment with me her mother yeah crazy helicopter parent may made sure that everything in the apartment we shared that all everything we needed for the apartment she insisted on picking out and she made sure that she had final say on everything there it's like oh my god December 4th the two shorts are keep on rolling and I love this one big fan first of all big fan of roller skating and disco so woohoo um, Mickey and his friends disco night at the roller rink is crashed by peg leg Pete and his gang of Disney villains. So yeah, you were talking about how they incorporate, they really made full use of the cadre of uh, Disney characters from the movies and other cartoons and such. Part of Pete's gang is Ursula. And voiced by Pat Carroll, uh, Ursula's original voice actress from the uh, 1989 film. Oh, interesting. So that's why I have you on the show for stuff like that. Yeah, I was really shocked to see Ursula as part of Pete's gang. I'm just kind of shocked seeing Ursula walk around on her tentacles like their legs. <laughs> well, it, you know. It, I'm sorry. I, I, every time I've ever seen Ursula move in the movie or 
when she cameos in House of Mouse or something like that, she's basically just kind of slithering across the floor as you would expect an octopus on dry land to do. This time, she's using her tentacles as legs, and it looks so, so bizarre. (laughs) So the premise of this one is that they're a roller derby team, because who doesn't love roller derby? And they take over the... They bully Mickey Mouse and his gang who are uh, roller disco uh, ro- <laughs> roller disco skating um, complete with the, the disco out- the 70s disco outfits which are fantastic Dude and did in the disco outfit so fun little fact the uh, if you do not know this they officially okay the uh, sorcerer from the sorcerer's apprentice the classic fantasia bit disney officially named that sorcerer yen sid Oh, get that's it. where I got that from. Yeah. Yeah. Get it? Get where Yen Sid comes from? <laughs> now that you mention it. Yeah, so I love that they had him as the DJ, and then when he pulls off the robe, he's wearing the yellow tank top, and I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> yeah, my son and I couldn't figure out who that was, and I think he said that he, he was... I think he he was the one that guessed that it was the wizard from The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yep, it was Yen Sid. Yeah, I thought it was, for some odd reason, and I guess because I saw Ursula and this is where my brain went, I thought it was, um, what's his face, the king of Atlantis. Triton? Uh, Triton, yeah. I thought it was maybe like a skinny version of Triton at first, and then, and then I was like, oh, it can't be that. <laughs> and then there was a part of my brain that it was, you know, it's the old man from the Looney Tunes cartoon uh, that runs to to right to the camera and in the Yosemite Sam bit, um, where you see the pirate ship and it's uh, the sad sack, formerly the Jolly Roger, and he yells, I was a man once, and like runs off camera again. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> you know the cartoon, though, right? Of course. Okay. Love that one. Bugs um, gets vibed with a free trip around the world, and as they're sailing off, the, he sees a little mouse on the deck that goes, He's not along for this world. <laughs> I uh, I can't tell you how many times I've quoted that cartoon. I, you know, like whatever is ha- something is happening, and I just kind of blurt out, "I was a man once," and run away. Um, ah, uh, yes, my you life in cartoons. Yeah, I'm surprised you don't blurt that out the more you spend time with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> I love my kids. Um, kids, are the best part of life. So I like this one. Uh, so th- the bit here is that everywhere they go, there's a reason they can't stay there. Um, first they're bullied out of the roller rink, and then. Um, I think they go to a place where there's like ballroom dancing, and I and oh, and it ends up being Beast Castle, which is funny. I, oh, I love the gag where Mickey says, "My friend Chip says his ballroom hasn't been used in years." That was <laughs> Chip, obviously the the Chip Cup. Yeah, that was. Um, I was like, I was. I didn't catch that the first time. Now, again, very clever writing. Uh, they bounce around a couple of different places, and finally, they just you know. <laughs> After being bullied enough times, they fight, you know, and having run out of places to go, they just go back to the roller rink and fight them off. Um, it's a funny cartoon. It's really good stuff. The next one, the Big Bad Wolf. Again, Mickey's an insane person. Um, in this one, he's trying to reform the Big Bad Wolf, who is voiced by Clancy Brown. Happy birthday, Mister Brown! You know today's Clancy Brown's birthday. Ah, what what excellent timing. Um. <laughs> Happy birthday to one of my all-time favorite voice actors. No one does Lex Luthor better than you. So, the whole concept here is that the Big Bad Wolf is doing what the Big Bad Wolf does. He comes in and he starts blowing houses down and he's trying to eat the three little pigs. And Mickey's like, you see... M- Mickey plays the part of the of the social worker from Oz who thinks he can reform everybody. <sighs> and did you ever watch Oz? Way too young. Okay. Well, if you have access to... Well, you have HBO uh, Max now. If you have a chance to sit down and watch Oz... Uh, it's not McNulty. That's The Wire. McManus! Um, all these I- Irish-Scottish uh, characters. Um, McManus, is the social worker in Oz, like, his big failing in life was that he really thought he could reform a lot of these, like, hardcore prisoners, and most of them took advantage of them, and a lot of this ended in grisly murder. Um, not quite the same thing here, but, you know, at some level, the same sort of premise. 
the big bad wolf is the big bad wolf, and he's trying to eat as many of the creatures in this fairy tale world as he possibly can. And Mickey's like, and Mickey like McManus is like, you just need a hug. <laughs> you just need a hug, and you need someone to give you a chance. And the big bad wolf's like, sure. <laughs> so, sure. Now go. What now? Why don't you introduce me to all your tasty looking friends? Oh, yeah. go to introduce me to more. And I just love how his idea of eating them. It, it's. I mean, obviously he can't like you know chew them or anything, but it's literally just like inhale, swallow, gulp. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it's kind of a gruesome cartoon when you think about it. I mean, it, like, nobody dies. It's a fucking Mickey Mouse cartoon for kids. But I, when you think about, like, what's really happening here, he's eating these animals whole. Mm-hmm. And, you and know, alive. And, and alive, yeah. And <laughs> Mickey doesn't pay, And Mickey, utterly clueless. No clue what's going on as his entire world is being eaten around him. Yeah, he doesn't um, even notice when Goofy sticks it, manages to stick his head through the skin of the wolf. Basically, like, man, get out of here! Yeah, just, it's just like, how oblivious are you? <laughs> yeah. So not only is Mickey a obli- uh, Mickey a lunatic, but he's also oblivious. Um, <laughs> and then of course, I, this is actually my favorite part is that after he's supposedly eaten everyone, the wolf invites Mickey over for dinner, and he comes to the house. And if you notice the background, it's. It's obviously the th- the house of the practical pig from Three Little Pigs, but they designed it to look just like the house did in the original 1930 short, complete with a framed picture of sauce. I think it's like sausages, and it says "mother." <laughs> and that was in the 1930 short. <laughs> Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? The big bad, the big wolf. bad wolf. The, the big, big bad, bad wolf. wolf. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Why do you say wolf with, like, woof? Because I'm from New York. Yeah, I was going to say, you're not saying wolf. You're say, you're you're trying to communicate with my dog. <laughs> Bow, wow, wow, yippee oh yippee eh? That's a lot of music on this show. All right. Um, <laughs> well, especially tonight. So, wait, what's, so remind me, what's the resolution? How does he finally get everybody out of there? He basically just starts getting the wolf to chase him and that every time the wolf hits a wall or something he coughs up one of the friends Terrific. more or less yeah all right um moving on to the following week december 11th we have the brave little squire okay i'm gonna quick get through the premise of this and then i have to talk about how this ended and how it affected my poor son so the brave little squire inspired by the brave little tailor you want to give a 30 second synopsis of the brave little tailor classic uh, fairy tale told through mickey mouse mickey is a tailor who kills seven flies with one stroke of his uh, fly swatter and when he triumphantly yells out his window i killed seven with one blow he happens to interrupt a group of gentlemen who are talking about killing giants and obviously there is a giant miscommunication that gets back to the king who thinks that this tiny little tailor can kill seven giants with one blow so he sends him off to kill the giant that's pillaging their kingdom and says if you get through this I'll give you my princess Minnie's hand in marriage it, it's a classic short it's one of uh, I'd say it's in the top maybe not 10 maybe top 15 greatest or classic Mickey Mouse shorts that everyone needs to see uh, just as an aside, one year for Halloween when we did Mickey's um, uh, Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween, uh, mm-hmm. I, the, one of the few, last few years you could actually dress up as an adult uh, at this thing. I mean, I guess I, I, I'm no, you can't wear masks anymore. That's that's the issue there. In any case, um, one of the few times I actually dressed up in costume for it, I dressed up as Willie the Giant. Oh, nice! Yeah, I pulled off a pretty good Willie too. Um, Today with the chocolate pot roast. Um, in any case, <laughs> this version we have Mortimer the mouse, who is voiced by Jeff Bennett, and Mortimer has been getting his squires killed in action and taking credit for what victories they do have in killing all manner of fantastical beast. Uh, even though he hasn't done any of those things, but. He is being lauded as a hero, and so he is in need of a new squire, and of course Mickey thinks he's the hero that he claims to be, and so Mickey volunteers, and of course he gets the job because, you know, he in this iteration of the cartoon is pig hostage. 
Um, and there's a couple of versions of this where uh, they go and fight a fantastical beast and Mortimer kind of shoves Mickey into the action and Mickey, despite himself, is victorious and Mortimer takes the, the Mortimer uh, claims the, the victory, takes the credit. It uh, is great th- Mickey run into danger head first with a wooden spoon screaming, Distraction! <laughs> They do this, there's a montage of this, where finally at the end of it, Mickey's like, I've had it. (laughs) Clearly this isn't going to change, and he's not getting any better. So he quits. And right about this time, uh, uh, gosh, I can't remember what attacks the kingdom. Oh, it's a dragon. Dragon. Yeah, so a dragon finally attacks the kingdom, and uh, Mortimer runs like hell. And so Mickey is left to deal with this dragon, and he throws water into its face. Like it's the wicked witch, and because well, he throws it into its open mouth and essentially kind of douses its, its um, pilot right. like, so to speak. So, so the the fact that the thing's the size of a dinosaur and still has razor sharp claws and teeth and everything else, and it, you know, and the, if the, God, the destructive power of a hurricane, some what we've been told from Schmog, uh, it you know it, it can't breathe fire, so it freaks out and runs away. Um, and so Mickey is made a knight, and Mortimer is put in the sto- in the, the stockade um, and they throw tomatoes at him. Now, go ahead, before well, I get into this. Yes. Oh, well, I was, I'm glad that they chose... <gasps> yes, thank you, Eddie. Two nights in a row you've interrupted me. <laughs> See, I told you, you start ca- saying wolf instead of wolf and now I'll send the dog things you, he's been invited on the show. Anyway, um, I really like that they had Mortimer as uh, the villain for this one. There's a he's Mortimer was introduced in a classic, very early Mickey's cartoon called Mickey's Rival. He isn't used that often uh, in modern cartoons. More often than not, if they're going to have an adversary for Mickey, it's going to be Pete. But I think this one works a lot better because Pete is so much more of just an adversarial bully. I don't think his character works as well for being a slimy uh, con man. That's that's something more that Mortimer fits the bill for. And Mortimer so also feel- shows up where Mickey, where Minnie is, and he's a rival for Mickey. He's a rival for Minnie's attention, and so exactly. in a situation where they're they're doing. You know where, where Minnie is the focus, and it's you know it's trying to get Minnie's attention. That's where you need Mortimer. Well, there's been a handful of shorts where Pete tries to very much in the veins of like Bluto, Olive Oil, and Popeye. Bluto, he, Pete will show up, grab Minnie, and say, "My girl now," and Minnie's going, "Mickey, help me, save me." But th- again, that's not going to work for this story arc where the queen, where Queen Minnie, has to be convinced that. Uh, this phony knight is re- I-, I love the line where he's talking about smiting the dragon and she goes and yet your uniform is still spotless <laughs> you know the- having Pete in that role isn't going to work because there is no way that Minnie would just blindly trust him right. Mortimer has always been Mortimer is someone we all know he's a slimy contemptible liar who somehow has managed to find a way to just fool everyone and we, we and one, you know, we all hate people like that. And he plays that part very well. Yep. Um, so I have to tell you what ha- the ending of this cartoon. Uh, I enjoyed this. I, you know, it, again, it's a take off of the the brave little uh, Taylor and all that, and it was fine. It's kind of typical Mickey Mouse, more traditional Mickey Mouse fare, just sort of an update on a classic. Mm-hmm. And I and I note it, and I start to hear whimpering. Like my son's sitting on the couch next to me. I'm kind of sitting forward because um, if you sit too far back in the couch, you end up like, you know, it's uncomfortable. So I'm sitting forward because I want to be able to hear the TV and, uh, you know, and I'm kind of and I'm into what's happening. So my son is sitting kind of behind me and mind you, he's six and a half growing on seven. And I start to hear him cry. Like, boo-hoo, I'm really upset, like, boo, you know, crying. Like bawling cry or yeah, like you know, uh, like breathing heavy and, and the whole nine yards. And I'm like, wait, what the fuck? How did this happen? I, so I stopped what we were watching for a minute, and even my daughter, who turned ten today, happy birthday, Lily, um, 
kind of looks over. He's like, what's going on? Like, how'd we lose Jonas all of a sudden? <laughs> so, so I'm like, buddy, what's what's happening? Why are you crying? And he was like, he, he, he didn't deserve to die. Brick? What? <laughs> I'm like, who didn't deserve... He was like, the guy, I know he lied, and he's not the hero Mickey is, but he didn't deserve to die. You don't deserve to die for lying. He, and I'm thought, like, oh. that they, he thought they killed Mortimer by putting him in the stockade? Yeah, apparently he thought they executed Mortimer. No, stockade is not used for <laughs> execution. Stockade yeah, is used for prolonged public humiliation. Yeah, it's not a guillotine, and I explained that to him. <laughs> because I think that's what he thought it was. Yeah, no, actually, people... The, the, essentially, if you were in the stockade for a long enough time, people would start bringing you food and water and stuff, because the idea of being in the stockade was you needed to survive the whole time to be humiliated. Right. If you died in the stockade, it just voided the punishment. So, he's crying hysterically. Because they thought he, he goes, you know, for the simple crime of lying about his deeds, they, he thought they, th this village of murderers fucking killed the guy. And he, you know, and my son, the defense attorney, was like, well, I, uh, a bit, bit harsh, I think. So I'm trying to calm him down. And I'm like, first of all, let's take this one by one. He's not dead. That's a stockade. And I'm trying to explain to him what a stockade is. And they're like, and, and, that, that, and then I think he thought the tomatoes were blood. Oh. So, so I'm like, they threw tomatoes at him to humiliate him. That's his punishment for being a liar, a liar and a cheat. And J Jonas goes, well, he didn't deserve that either. They couldn't just send him away. I'm like, oh, my God, Jonas. <laughs> Your son's got a bleeding heart and it's adorable. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, between between him and the ra and the raging feminist daughter I have, I, I've got a lot of, <laughs> I've got a long road ahead of me. To to <sighs> to at the very least libertarian parents and two raging liberal children. It's gonna be exactly. fantastic. <laughs> um, all right, Ain't, nobody cares about our politics, and so let's move on. But I had to share that story about my son. Like, I can't believe he reacted that way. Um, yeah. No, make, yeah, make sure he knows that if you were in the stockade, you survived. Because, like I said, if you died in the stockade, they're like, oh, shit, then what are we going to do for fun now? Yeah. Um, the next one is an ordinary date. Mickey and Minnie try to make their date an original and excitable one. Like, this was fine. The idea here is um, <laughs> Mickey is trying to take Minnie on the perfect date. Minnie is trying to take Mickey on the perfect date. They keep trying to outdo one another. But everything they try backfires and explodes and so they try to top it and to the point you know and and um i think they tried this on an episode of friends <laughs> that's what this felt like because on the one hand you've got the boys uh pulling shenanigans and the girls pulling shenanigans on the other side and finally everyone just quits and says i've had it with all of you and i'm walking away from this entire stupid situation and minnie and mickey just have a simple date i this was i mean it was Again, it was a repetitive gag, and the gags just got bigger and bigger until it finally got so big they had to resolve the cartoon. It was fine. I laughed. Um, not their best one. Yeah, the idea is the slapstick that Donald, Goofy, Daisy, and Clarabelle Cow go through. Uh, for the record, always fun to see Clarabelle Cow get some screen time. She is a horribly miss... Uh, or not. She, they really don't use her enough. She's a very uh, fun... In uh, Minnie's, um, gosh, what was the show on Disney Junior? Minnie had her own spinoff from the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. um, it was Minnie. Shit, I can't remember what the hell she was selling, but I, I was like maybe it was like jewelry or clothing or something like that. Minnie's Boutique, that was the name of the show, uh, and Clarabelle Cow, I think, worked there or. Did did some worked with Minnie in some? Fa I, I know it was Minnie and Daisy who ran the shop, and then Clarabelle Cow made frequent appearances on the show. Okay, but yeah, again, the humor in this is just from the over the top slapstick. I mean, you get an end where Mickey and Minnie both simultaneously tell their friends, "Okay, we're going to go with the nuclear option. Everything at once," and it is. <laughs> 
just craziness to the point where Donald accidentally drops a box of fireworks into the uh, fire pit oven at the restaurant. So everything just starts blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny, actually. And I, I like the, there's a couple little bits I really like. There's a scene where they're driving down the road and Mickey and Minnie are both trying to be subtle in giving signals to their friends and Mickey says something. It's like, I know you like, it's like, check out all these, those animals over there, Minnie. I know you like seeing all the wild life. <laughs> and obviously he's screaming that part out. And then Minnie does pretty much the exact same thing. And I, I just like how they're trying to be subtle around each other, but they're both so oblivious. They don't get what the other person's doing. Yeah. Um, not my favorite. It, you know, like it's not bad. It's just, it was like, meh. Mm hmm. I think I enjoyed this one more than uh, the, the first day of school one with Goebbels. Okay. But I, I think it's because I just like watching, you know, Daisy and Goofy and Donald and all of them just have to suffer because Mickey and Minnie are too oblivious. Um, okay. And the last two here... We have Supermarket Scramble, Mini. I think this was one of... This might have been the only one where I was either on my phone or walking in and out of the room. Um, but the premise here is that Mickey and friends are going to have a barbecue, and they're in the grocery store, and hijinks ensue. This actually... First of all, I have a question. Who buys lobsters for a barbecue? This depends on kind of a fancy barbecue you're having. Yeah, I get that, but they're they're having hot dogs. Okay, well, hot dogs and lobsters is gross. But a normal yeah. person, you know, surf and turf, you know what I mean? Well, sure, but yeah, I guess I just kind of, when he said, it's like, okay, Minnie, you get the meat, Donald, you get the fruit, I'll get the fixings, Goofy, get the lobsters. I'm like, lobsters? Well, clearly they just wanted to set up blue Goofy in a lobster tank. This does have my absolute favorite gag, though. Daisy decides to wait out front with the car and keep it running, and it's, first of all, that's not what you do when you keep the car running. When you keep the car running, you don't just leave it in front of the car. You don't just stay in your car in front. You keep driving around the parking lot until the ever, until the people that you're waiting for come out front, and then you pull back up to the front. That's the way that works. But it's great because she's sitting in there in her convertible, and a policeman comes and tells her she needs to move. And she rolls up the window. The top is still pulled back in the convertible. She goes, sorry, windows up. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that just killed me the way she said that. Um, yeah, the, the the last bit, I think, they've got, they they finally got everything from the super. I can't even remember what what was taking so long in the supermarket and why they couldn't get their shit together. But eventually... Um, go ahead. Then he got caught up in a uh, massive panic over... How over a hot dog sale. Um, Donald suddenly developed the ability to shoot static charges from trying to open those damn plastic baggies for the fruit. And Mickey somehow got promoted to store manager because <laughs> he's too much. Mickey is too much of a people pleaser and cannot stop helping those in need. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. I love it. Cause he actually does says, I can't help it. I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> um, so they finally have their picnic. They finally get all the shit out of the grocery store. Uh, they get in the car. They take off. They go to have their picnic, and they forget Goofy, who's in the lobster tank. That did seem like a bit of a weird joke, especially because I, I hate to say it, part of me when they left. I was like, it, it, I wasn't even so wrapped up in the action to go, wait, where's Goofy? Right. So when they left, I was literally saying, okay, so the gag's going to be they forgot Goofy. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So you mentioned a few times now that they, they weaved some sort of juvenile horror elements into this 10 episode, 8 minutes per shorts series. And I don't know why. Like, I don't know why Mickey's a psycho. I don't know why. We need to have horror elements in this. I, I I don't know what audience we're going for here, but my both me and my kids freaked out about this, and it's kind of a funny premise. Certainly, being a married man, you know, and and you know, my wife and I having those moments of would the phone stop ringing? Would people just leave us the hell alone? You know, just needing 
needing a day to yourself to convalesce certainly rang true in my house. But the premise of this one is that Donald and Daisy have been going out with Mickey and Minnie on double dates for what seems like forever, and they just want a day to themselves. They just kind of want to hang back in the house and watch TV and be together and not deal with anybody, like any normal couple. And Minnie and Mickey... And so they cancel on Minnie and Mickey, but the way they do it is they say that they're sick. At which point Minnie and Mickey psychotically try to come to the house to take care of them. And all of a sudden this whole thing turns into a horror movie. Yeah, it, it's, a, you know, it's essentially it's a zombie setup where, you know, the Night, Night of the Living Dead or something like that, um, where Donald and Daisy are in the house and they're trying to keep zombie Mickey and zombie Minnie out of the house. I was um, going with killers, personally. Which one are you going with? Serial killers. Okay. Um, I, I was thinking, I can't remember which zombie movie this was, but the uh, you know it's a handful of survivors in a in a mall, and they're you know and the, they're trying to barricade the mall to keep the zombies out, and it ends with them on the roof. Dawn uh, of the Dead. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Um, so this is Dawn of the Dead Mickey Mouse remake because why why not make every remake everything with either Muppets or Mickey Mouse? And if you're saying what well, Muppets, why is he bringing that up? Because recently somebody put out an article saying they sh- uh, the, the Great Gatsby has entered into public domain and it should be remade with Muppets. And there is a, now a very large fan base for that. Weird, man. Look, maybe it's a comic book, but I, I don't know if I can handle live-action Muppets doing The Great Gatsby. We do yeah. know what happened in The Great Gatsby, right? Um, The recent Great Gatsby with Leonardo DiCaprio is actually one of mine and Andre's favorite movies. Okay, now picture it with Muppets. I really don't want to see Kermit get shot in the back of his swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of sex and nonsense that goes on in The Great Gatsby. Um, anyway, moving on. So, uh, this finally ends with uh, Donald and Daisy end up in the hospital, and they think they're alone now. There doesn't seem to be anyone around. But, but lo and behold, the camera pans back, and there's Mickey and Minnie in the hospital with them. Because they got sick chasing them in the rain. Um, my suggestion to the people, the good people working on this show, maybe not so much horror next time. <laughs> maybe, maybe make it light and funny and, you know, I don't know, not have wolves eating people whole and zombies and psychotic Mickey Mouse. Yeah, there, there's a bit where Daisy, or I'm sorry, Minnie's walking up the stairs after Daisy and her shadow hits the wall, but the shadow, her the shadows of her fingers keep moving further down the wall and I just remember looking and going, God damn, that's like a Hellraiser thing. Jesus. Yeah, that's uh, utterly unnecessary. Uh, um, song saying, Daisy, Daisy, I heard you had the flu. Oh my God. It, there's, there's a few seeds of this that actually get your, toe, your toes curled. I kept looking back at Andre and we were just like, in what, what universe is making this creepy? Yeah, like, why is this, you know, as, um, I can't remember which cartoon I got this from, but uh, as the cartoon once asked of its audience, is this strip really necessary? That is several um, Looney Tunes and Tex Avery shorts. Yes, yes, definitely Tex Avery. Um, years ago when I was a kid, my uh, one of my dad's friends and therefore, my, our, you know, I was friends with their children um the father was bragging about how he had gotten the entire collection of Tex Avery shorts on Laserdisc when Laserdisc was a thing oh wow yep uh but yeah Tex Avery's hilarious in any case so my final thoughts and I'll give you the the last word here um I enjoyed these like I said I, I think I had more patience for these than I did the Looney Tunes ones. Um, the, Looney Tunes actually recently released a Christmas a series of Christmas ones, and I put it on for my kid, and I just went in the kitchen and cooked dinner. I didn't even watch it. Um, we're gonna when Looney Tunes comes out, the they're calling it um, season one C, season one A we reviewed, season one B was the Christmas series, which I didn't bother with. 
and then the, the second half of season one, season one C, comes out January twenty first, and we'll review it the following week. But um, I, you know, I, I think uh, as I said before, I laughed harder at the Mickey Mouse stuff when it wasn't freaking me the. <laughs> freaking me out or causing my son to have some sort of conniption. <laughs> um, so, so I got, you know, I got past the, I don't love the animation. This isn't really the style of animation I, I enjoy, but I, I had, a, you know, I accepted it for what it was and I enjoyed the humor when it was there and I'm looking forward to see what they do with this uh, in the next iteration of this series. And what did you think overall? <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I felt that it did a good job keeping the same creativity that we saw with the previous Mickey Mouse shorts that were airing on Disney Channel and YouTube. Uh, the voice acting is all great. Caitlin Robrock is uh, a very good choice for many. It, it was really sad for vo- uh, for fans of classic Disney when we lost Rusty Taylor last year. She had been the voice of many for ages. You do know she was married to Wayne Allwine, right? Who? The voice of Mickey Mouse. Who? The previous voice of Mickey Mouse and the previous voice of Minnie Mouse were married to each other. Well, that's convenient. Yeah, and he sadly died a while back, and she died last year. So, but uh-huh. so, but uh, I, I think Caitlin Robrock did a really good job uh, with the character. So she's a very good choice for the role now. Um, I. Yeah, Mickey's a little more insane in this, but I still enjoyed it. It still made me laugh. And I will probably watch these uh, few episodes again until, you know, we get more animation. So I highly recommend it, especially to anyone who's a fan of classic Disney. Uh, Common Sense Media rated the show three out of five stars, stating the characters are put in different outlandish scenarios from one episode to the next and play versions of themselves that maintain their relationship and personalities. Familiar foes arrive on the scene to cause trouble, but injuries are quickly remedied, and accidents rarely amount to any realistic harm. Well, yeah, it's a fucking cartoon. Um, So I want to ask you, I want to take the opportunity, as we conclude uh, our look at the wonderful world of Mickey Mouse season one-ish, you have been watching the contemporary 2017 DuckTales. Give me the 50 words or less on this. They got David Tennant to play Scrooge McDuck. What else do you need? Go watch. Go watch. Oh, oh Danny Cootie's in this too. And Ben Schwartz. Yeah. And Lynn manuel Miranda's Gizmo Duck. Um, so I was just reading that uh, DuckTales um, is in its third season. I guess the first half of it uh, is out now. And this third season is going to be the last of it. But um, they will release the final episodes of season three sometime this year. And so I say unto thee, do you have any interest in reviewing the series when it concludes? Yes, but we have to (laughs) hold off on the review until after all the episodes are on Disney Plus. Okay. Because that's the only way I can watch them. They're not all currently on Disney Plus? Nope. Season three's not yet. Really? Huh. I had assumed they all were. I, I thought everything got moved to Disney Plus. How bizarre. How yeah. bizarre. Da, 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 da. How bizarre. You know that one? Seriously, what is up with all the music between the two of us tonight? The first and second season have been released on Disney Plus since its launch, but users have noted episodes being out of order. The series had its episodes arranged in the proper order on June 26, 2020. Um... Okay, so we're waiting for the whole thing to show up on, uh, for season three to show up. That's what we're waiting for? Yes. Okay, well, that's fine. I, I'm sorry, I don't actually have TV or cable. I well, have a computer. Well, no, I, no, I, in, I, absolutely. Um, as I said, I thought the, I thought the whole thing was going straight to Disney Plus. If it has to do, I guess, Disney XD first, have it run there and then be ported over. Yeah, I'm with you. I'll just wait until the whole thing shows up on Disney Plus and we'll go from there. Yes, but when it does, I will happily talk about it. I have, oh God, says this in the, within this last year of the shutdown, I think I've binge watched the first two seasons at least three times. It's that good, huh? Um, I keep rewatching the Three Caballeros episode. <laughs> okay. 
Um, all right. I mean, There's I enjoyed back to another one of our reviews. Plug, yeah. plug. I mean, I um, I enjoyed the 1987 iteration of Ducktales. I watched a l- large part of that. I wasn't into like Goof Troop and all the, and the stuff that would come out after Ducktales, but Ducktales proper and the movie that prompted the Ducktales television show, uh, I was into as a kid. You know, in '87 I was uh, 11 years old, so this was you know I was in right in there with the uh, with the age bracket that this would have been made for. You know, and I, can, I don't know I how much of my I don't, I don't know I don't know how much of Ducktales my kids have watched. So it'd be something fun I can watch with them. Well, Goof Troop was definitely a little bit more. Goof Troop has not aged nearly as well. The original Ducktales had much more of a timeless feel to it. And here's a fun little thing: I was, we were just talking about Ressie Taylor, the previous voice of Minnie. She was also the voice of uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie in the '87 uh, uh, series. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that takes us to the end of our show here. Um, La, Alexis Haina and I reviewed Red Sonia and Vampirella Meet Betty and Veronica yesterday, and then the day after tomorrow, uh, depending on when you're listening to this, we will be reviewing the second season of His Dark Material, which was mostly based on the book The Subtle Knife. And that's going to be it for you for a little bit until the 19th when you and 97 other people will be reviewing the Mandalorian season two. I, I, I almost feel like saying it's like, did I volunteer for that too late or should I back out and just let the rest of you guys have fun with that one? No, it, it's, it's the same crew as it was for Lucifer. So assuming we don't have Skype issues, it's fine. Um, if, if not, not <laughs> if not, I'm once again, letting Andrew take control and I'm just going to sit back and listen to you all talk about the Mandalorian which has been spoiled for me just you know this is one of the the downsides to me watching things in the order I'm going to podcast on them and not watching them when they are just released like everybody else does like so far more or less the stuff from Cobra Kai hasn't been completely ruined but yeah the cameo at the end of the Mandalorian season two completely ruined for me because it was everywhere like in our chats you guys did a pretty good job of not telling me who what, what happened but every every nerd comic book outlet spoiled it across the board. I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> I feel bad because I follow Mark Hamill on Instagram, and the day that that was released, he posted a picture of himself with the uh, with his finger over his mouth, going "shush," and that was it. No tags, nothing. Right. Yeah, I it, there was no escaping it, and it's just you know it is what it is. Um, and then finally, you will be on for two back to back show three. Uh, back to back to back shows as a matter of fact we're going to be doing we're finishing up our run on the com- chilling adventures of sabrina comic book issues six seven and eight we've already done the first uh five issues uh, last year when season three came out and then we'll be discussing season four on january 26th and then looney tunes one c as i said before on january 28th so you asked for it you got it alexis a whole lot of podcasting in the month of january I asked for this? Yes, you asked for this. Um, go ahead and plug your uh, plug your your shop. All right. Honeysuckle Rose Creations, the intersection of geek and chic. I mentioned this last night, but I'll go ahead and say it again. I want to thank everyone who uh, was a part of our charity drive uh, for every order that was placed uh, over the holiday throughout the month of December. We donated $5 to St. Jude's and we ended up with over $250 in donations. So again, thank you so much to everyone who participated in that. You guys are the best. We're getting ready to put a bunch of new stuff on the site. We're also trying to get uh, caught up with our marketing paperwork because it is January and it's supposed to be the slow month. Keyword supposed to be. <laughs> Uh, at this moment, we do not know when we are going to be on the road again for Comic-Cons. We are waiting to see. Looks like a lot of the big name uh, conventions are just kind of holding a uh, rot- holding a pattern around the, the news. We're waiting to see how things go with the vaccines and whatnot. I will, as soon as they announce something, I will be putting out announcements on Facebook, Instagram, and under duress Twitter about which shows we will be attending and when we'll be back on the road. Until then, you can always find our stuff on Etsy and Handmade at Amazon. Honeysuckle Rose Creations, the intersection of geek and chic. All righty. 
Uh, so thank you for checking out our show tonight. Uh, appreciate you all for listening. For Alexis Haina, I'm Mark Rattledge. Be well, be safe, and behave. 